Today, let's play some migration numbers number wang. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance and Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news. Well, as we come up to the festive season, it seems a great time to play some number wang games with the numbers from the ABS because today, we got the ABS National State and Territory Population data from June 2025. Yes, somewhat old figures. They reported the Australian population grew by 1.5% in the 12 months to June 2025 to 27.6 million people. That's 420,100 more than June 2024. The natural increase, the number of births minus the number who died, added 114,600 people from June 2024 to 2025, but the number of births and deaths registered in Australia also increased by 3.4% and 0.3% respectively. But net overseas migration was 305,600 people from June 2024 to June 2025. There were 568,500 overseas migration arrivals and 262,800 departures. That compares with 329,925 in December 2024. Western Australia again had the fastest rise in population at 2.2%, with Victoria and Queensland equal highest second. Both grew by 1.8%, while Tasmania saw the slowest growth over the 12 month period, with a 0.2% rise in population. Now, first, I want to take these ABS figures as is because as you will see later, I do have some questions. At 1.5% population growth, that's significantly higher than the average across advanced economies, including the US, UK, Japan, Canada, and the Eurozone 4, which stands in aggregate at 0.6%. But if you compare Australian quarterly population growth with that of Canada and New Zealand, then the trends are starkly different because in Canada, they have deliberately turned migration settings down to tackle housing pressures. And in New Zealand, though slightly less deliberately, they have also cut migration. The results are an easing in rental costs and home prices, highlighting the links between housing costs and high migration. Another way to look at this is to ask how long it would take to add another million people to the population via net migration. As Alex Joyner showed, in the fourth quarter of the year 2000, it would take 12 years of net migration to add the million compared with just 2.5 years now, with a rise of more than 7 million people over that period. No wonder migration is a major debating point in Australia just now. Actually, the 20-year average for migration pre-COVID was around 200,000, but now we're running migration 50% higher. That's in the middle of a clear housing crisis. The Institute of Public Affairs analysis highlights that between 1945 and 2007, migration was around 90,000 each year. It jumped to around 228,000 between 2008 and 2019, and jumped yet again to 424,000 between 2023 and 2025. Looking in more detail, the net overseas migration was strongest into Victoria and New South Wales, but the other states also saw inward flows, so this is a national challenge. And the final point here is that the natural increase from births minus deaths was 0.42 percentage points compared with 1.12 percentage points from migration. There were just over 300,000 births on an annual rolling basis and around 106,000 deaths again over the rolling 12 months. But the crude birth rate per 1,000 people is still very low compared with the earlier decades. Turning now to interstate movements, there have also been some significant shifts, with more than 302,000 people shifting in the year to June 2025. But there are massive state variations, with a strong drift to Western Australia, which helps to explain the housing pressures there. But as the breakdown shows, net interstate migration was negative into New South Wales, but positive in Queensland, Western Australia in particular, with little movement from Victoria. Now, here we have to remember that the Treasury's Centre for Population noted in its handbook, Fundamentals of Migration Australia, that permanent and long-term arrival measures are, quote, an early indicator of future migration flows. 
While net permanent and long-term arrivals and net overseas migration differ slightly, they remain closely related measures. The latter, in effect, is an adjustment to the former to incorporate the 12 over 16 rule. When an arrival counts as an overseas migrant arrival, if the person stays in Australia for 12 of the following 16 months. Conversely, the departure is counted as a case of expatriation if the individual lives overseas for the 12 of the following 16 months. Determination as to whether a person makes a permanent or long-term journey into Australia does not incorporate the 12 over 16 rule. So, as measuring net overseas migration lags behind permanent and long-term movements, the question is to what extent can net permanent and long-term arrivals act as a proxy to estimate net overseas migration? Well, heading into the release of the official second quarter population immigration data from the ABS, all indicators were pointing to an increase, a record 448,500 net permanent and long-term arrivals were recorded for the first 10 months of 2025, as this data from Tarek Brooker shows. But it's interesting that recently the ABS has been contacting analysts, reminding them that the net overseas migration figures, which are heavily delayed, of course, should not be proxied from the more current arrivals and departures series. Now, I discussed this with Leith van Onselen on our recent live show. This despite the early statements from the government's own centre of population. Other evidence also suggests that strong working population growth Australia is in train. Indeed, last week's labour force release for November showed that annual growth in the civilian working age population, that's 15 plus, bottomed in March 2025 at 415,100. That's an increase of 1.9%. And this has recently firmed growing by 457,200 or 2% as at November 2025. And as Tarek notes, there is a clear, strong correlation between the net permanent long-term arrivals and the growth in the working age population, something confirmed by the September quarter national accounts released this month, which also suggests that annual population growth accelerated to around 451,200 in the third quarter of 2025, up from a low of 422,500 in the first quarter of 2025. Even today, the ABS released the detailed labour force survey for November, which recorded the strongest annual working age population growth since September last year, after bottoming in March 2025. Which begs the question, why has it reported falling net overseas migration and stable population growth when, on the same day, it released the detailed labour force statistics for November showing the strongest working age population growth since September 2024? So how do we square the migration data, heavily delayed, with the June 2025 series just landing, with these other more recent series pointing to more significant growth? The short answer is, well, I'm not sure we can, but we can ask why it does take so long to calculate the migration data in Australia, compared with, say, New Zealand, where it's already released migration data to October 2025, or Canada, who's released their September quarter of 2025 already. Perhaps one clue is that recent data from the Department of Home Affairs showed that there were close to 3 million people with temporary visas in Australia as at the end of October this year. This is the equivalent to more than 10% of Australia's entire population. Now, these would not necessarily be counted in the migration statistics, of course. As the IPA said recently, Australia is the greatest nation on earth, so it is hardly a surprise that so many people want to come here. But... Any migration program must be planned for and have values capability, which plainly is not happening. The mess that is Australia's migration system should not be blamed on the migrants. The blame should be directly squared at the federal government. With per capita economic growth in retreat again and Australia's ongoing housing crisis, the federal government's mass migration program is making Australians poorer. The government must admit its past mistakes and hit the brakes on migration inflows until such time that housing, public infrastructure and critical services are able to keep up with Australia's population growth. Yes, I agree with that. What is clear is that the ABS is again caught in a massive number wang, which means we need to ask the disturbing question, have our political masters 
got at the scorekeepers. What do you think? We certainly should not have to wait between six and nine months to get an official read on immigration and population growth. But are they as accurate as they should be? Well, who knows? I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.